Yep, thank you so much. And uh, thanks so much for uh, Denita for inviting me here. Uh, it's a little bit weird to be here, honestly. I'm a software engineer, not an astronomer, not a physicist. Uh, in fact, I got my bachelor's degree and left school pretty quick. Uh, so um, I'm a, feel a little bit fish out of water uh, here, but uh, hopefully uh, can can uh, talk about some cool stuff. Uh, so uh, as she mentioned, uh, I work on the Dragonfly mission. Uh, Dragonfly is going to Saturn's moon Titan. Uh, it'll launch in 2027, uh, carry some cool science experiments uh, and instruments there with it. Um, and will hopefully operate uh, on the surface of Titan from the early 2030s for about three years. Uh, and so as a software engineer, this is a presentation I gave actually about a year ago. A few of the graphics are out of date. I'll talk about those uh, when we get to them. Uh, and hopefully, though, uh, it'll be useful and, uh, and fun for everybody. So uh, this talk, you know, what's on Titan and why are we going? Um, I'm going to talk about some stuff that probably many of you already know uh, through that, but um, I'll try to give it as an overview anyway. Uh, then I'll talk about the Dragonfly mission. What are we sending? out to Titan, uh, and how are we going to explore it? There's some interesting aspects of our concept of operations, how we're going to operate Dragonfly, and what it does to study Titan. Uh, and then I'll go into some of the software capabilities that uh, may be uh, interesting. Um, maybe I'll go kind of fast through those, because that's more for the software conference that this was originally designed for. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about Titan. Titan uh, is about 5,000 uh, kilometers wide. The surface gravity is about 0.14 g, uh, so it's about 14% of the gravity at Earth's surface. Uh, the surface pressure is really high, uh, and it's also really cold. So one of the interesting things uh, about Titan, then, is that the combination of, uh, of low gravity and dense atmosphere means that aerial flight uh, like a drone or a winged craft or a helicopter, becomes very efficient uh, from a power perspective. And so that's what Dragonfly is going to do, uh, is it will be an eight-rotor drone that will fly around Titan and carry its uh, science instruments from place to place. Uh, in fact, Titan uh, has such a low gravity and such a dense atmosphere that a human being can fly on it with muscle power alone. The, the energy equations work out that if you got some wings, you could flap your wings uh, and fly around on Titan. So uh, that makes for a pretty interesting uh, you know, image for a lot of people. Uh, you'd freeze to death, you wouldn't have enough oxygen, it'd be very uncomfortable uh, out there. But uh, you know, if, if you could get there, if you could survive and carry all of your uh, environmental equipment with you, uh, human muscle power of an average adult human is sufficient to uh, lift yourself off the ground and go flying. Um, so maybe one day we'll get those. Um, but why are we going to Titan at all, right? Why are we going to Titan? It's really about prebiotic chemistry. It's really about the complex chemistry that exists uh, on the surface of Titan. So there's energy, sunlight, and photochemistry. So solar UV radiation comes in uh, to, the, uh, to the haze of the atmosphere, and that generates energy, generates some more complex chemical compounds. Uh, and then there's organic material uh, on the surface. But the other thing is Titan has a methane cycle. Titan has uh, liquid uh, reservoirs of methane on the surface, uh, and the temperature and conditions on Titan are such that that liquid methane can condense into clouds and rain. Uh, that dense atmosphere with winds through the atmosphere also produces mixing uh, of uh, all the different surfaces on Titan. So we expect that given the combination of uh, liquid water, uh, especially from impact melts, as well as uh, methane, um, driving that methane cycle that you get uh, a lot more mixing than you would on most other planets. For example, like the moon being very geologically dead, uh, you may have the right atomic compositions, but you don't get the opportunity to generate the really complex carbon chains and complex uh, molecules that result uh, from all of that. So um, on Titan, you know, you get river channels, you get lakes, you get clouds, you get rain, you get impacts uh, and impact melts. And so you can get some really complex chemistry going there. Um, the, the scientists that work on this mission uh, say that, um, you know, they use the term prebiotic chemistry, that the chemical compounds that are being generated on Titan uh, are similar to that of Earth potentially four billion years ago before life arose. And of course, we can't see those. We can't see those chemical compounds now. Life kind of erased that whole record. Uh, but on Titan, maybe we can go and see how far that's progressed, see what sort of chemical compounds uh, that that mixing promotes. So where exactly are we going uh, on Titan? So I got a couple pictures here. Uh, so uh, the background here is a global map of Titan. Uh, there are equatorial dune seas. Uh, so uh, uh, dunes regularly spaced, formed by the wind of Titan. 
And uh, one of the reasons that we're targeting the dune seas is because uh, when we get there, of course, we have to land, and we won't have a concrete landing pad. Uh, when we get there, nobody's prepared any landing pads for us, so we need to find a safe place to land. So I'll talk a little bit about our autonomous hazard detection and things like that that we're doing to be able to find safe landing sites. Uh, but one of the analog terrains that we use to study and, and adjust our engineering is that uh, is the Namib Desert uh, in Africa. We expect the dunes in Namib to be somewhat similar to that that we might find on Titan. But the other reason that we're going here is because of that impact crater right there, that Selk crater on Titan. And so if we land in the safe spots, at least initially, and then work our way north using our drone flights, uh, then we can analyze both the organic sand materials and interdune materials of the dune seas, and then move up into the crater and get into the center of the crater and analyze the chemical composition that may have resulted from the impact melts uh, of the Selk crater. So what's our mission timeline? Uh, so this image is entirely out of date. Uh, we, this uh, had us uh, launching in early 2027. Now it's mid 2027, they changed our rocket on us. Uh, we are now going to go out to the asteroid belt to do a deep space maneuver, come back in, uh, do an earth flyby and then go out to Saturn. Uh, so um, that changed our mission uh, somewhat, but it changed our cruise duration from about 10 years to about six years, six and a half years actually. So um, our power source will be better when we get there. Um, we'll arrive on Titan in the early 2030s. It's a direct atmospheric entry. We're not going to go into Saturn orbit or Titan orbit. We're going to go screaming right into the atmosphere. Uh, but because Titan has such a dense atmosphere, because the atmosphere is so tall with the low gravity, uh, we spend hours on our parachute, right? The heat shield uh, gets our heat flux uh, very high. We're still hundreds of kilometers up by the time the heat shield has done all of its work. And that's actually a concern for us because we still have to have enough battery power to last us all the way to the surface. So that becomes an engineering challenge. Um, the, the Mars rovers and, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory have the phrase seven minutes of terror uh, when referring to the Mars entry because Mars's atmosphere is so close to the ground and it's, uh, and it's uh, so light. Uh, we talk about this as two hours of mild anxiety uh, is, is, uh, is the joke. So what are we sending to Titan? Well, we've got our spacecraft, right? So we've got our cruise stage right here. This has our propellant tanks for deep space maneuvers, star trackers, sun sensors, all the usual parts uh, of a spacecraft. And then we've got our entry vehicle, which has uh, our heat shield at the bottom, our back shell that has uh, all of our parachutes uh, in it, and then our lander, our rotorcraft lander. So that's uh, uh, the image of it there uh, with our high gain antenna deployed. So it would normally be stowed against the back uh, when we're flying for drag reduction, but on the surface it can be deployed and point towards Earth. Uh, it is all direct to Earth communication, so unlike the Mars rovers with a fleet of Mars orbiting spacecraft, we have to communicate all the way back to Earth uh, directly with no, uh, no relay orbiter. So our data rates are very low, uh, and that's been one of our biggest concerns. We put a lot of uh, modeling effort into making sure that we can take the science and, uh, measurements that we need on the surface and still be able to get all that data back to Earth. Uh, but our total mission downlink is expected to be on the order of 10 or 20 gigabits total for three years on the surface, right? So we're, um, we're not going to have those super fancy videos that you saw from Mars Perseverance, maybe of its entry and landing. Uh, that would blow our entire data budget for years. We wouldn't be able to take any other measurements. Um, so we do have cameras. We'll be sending some images back, uh, and I'll talk about those science instruments. So this is the part here that I'm sure most of you are going to be uh, most interested in. So this is our instrument suite uh, with a cutaway drawing showing uh, where all those are. Um, so we've got our DragMet instrument. That's our uh, Dragonfly Geophysics and Meteorology package. Um, it's got uh, a, a data acquisition box and then a whole bunch of sensors uh, scattered all over the lander. So we're going to have things like electric field measurements, uh, Schumann resonance, we're going to have a seismometer, hydrogen sensors, methane sensors, all sorts of other little things to help us monitor the weather and um, uh, the weather and, and all the other properties of, of Titan that we're interested in. Um, the other two uh, instruments that we have that are particularly interesting are DRAMS and DRACO. Uh, DRAMS is the giant orange thing at the nodes of Dragonfly. That's our mass spectrometer, right? But then we need to feed stuff into the mass spectrometer, so that's where DRACO comes in. DRACO is our drill, um, and so there are two drills uh, mounted here and here. 
um, that uh, will be able to take um, drill just into the surface. There's no robot arm or anything. It just drills wherever we land uh, and then feed in material into the mass spectrometer. Um, so we'll have several different modes of the mass spectrometer, and I'm sure you all know way more about that stuff than I do. Um, so I'm not going to get myself in trouble by going uh, too far out of my comfort zone there. Uh, but we'll be able to uh, be very sensitive. In fact, one of the measurements that I know a lot of people are really excited about uh, is we'll be able to do chi uh, chirality measurements. Uh, of, of the surface, and so that's one of our like life detection kind of things. If we see uh, more left-handed or right-handed uh, molecules on the surface of Titan, then that gives us some indication of life, um, some indication of life. Uh, we're also, of course, going to have cameras. Uh, some of those cameras will point straight down, uh, be able to image things uh, both the close end of the surface when we're landed, but also when we're flying, be able to take surface images at regular intervals and be able to build up a terrain map as we fly. Uh, we'll have forward-looking cameras that can look out straight out so that when we're scouting for future landing sites for future flights after our current one, we'll be able to know where to go. We'll also have panoramic cameras mounted on top of our uh, high-gain antenna. So when our high-gain antenna is moving around, we can take pictures using that and build up a panorama of our landing spot. Um, and then last but not least, we have dra uh, dragons, our gamma ray neutron spectrometer. And so uh, neutrons are absorbed by Titan's atmosphere, so we got to bring our neutron source with us. Uh, and so that allows us to do uh, atomic detection of the bulk elemental composition below the lander and look at uh, you know, the different numbers of, of atoms that are within about a meter or so of the surface uh, of Dragonfly. So what about our mobility system, right? So this is all the thing that gets us from place to place. Uh, in order to understand Titan, we don't just want to go to one spot. Uh, we want to take all of these measurements and then we want to go check another spot a few kilometers away and then another few kilometers away and then another few kilometers away. We actually expect that our total mission traverse will be on the order of about 150 to 200 kilometers. That's really what we're, what we're going for. So we're going to cover a lot of ground over three and a half years. Uh, Titan's atmosphere is four times denser than Earth, uh, so it reduces our wing and rotor area required for lift, uh, and the gravity is lower. So there's that, that note about a human could put on wings and fly on Titan. Um, but it's, it's, a big, it's a big rotorcraft. It's not a handheld drone kind of thing. Uh, so this is our principal investigator, uh, Dr. Zibby Turtle, planetary scientist at APL, and that's her holding one of the rotors, uh, not a flight rotor, a manufacturing demonstrator. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a big thing. That's just one of these eight rotors. Um, so it's a big drone carrying some big instruments uh, all the way to Titan. Our exploration strategy uh, is pretty fun, so don't bother reading all this too much. Um, but the point uh, that's interesting about this is our leapfrog exploration strategy. So when we go fly, we're going to go fly out maybe 10 kilometers, scout a site, and then come back another 5 kilometers, and then land at, a at the spot that we scouted on the previous flight. And that allows us to both manage uh, the scientific uh, usefulness of any particular site, because when we go here uh, to scout a particular site, we'll be able to get a ton of imagery of a large area. And then the scientists on the ground can have a few weeks to plan the next flight and say, we want to go to that spot. Uh, exactly. So we're only going to land at a place that is safe and that has been previously scouted for potential science usefulness. Uh, so, uh, you know, flight one may go like this, uh, and then the next flight would take off from this blue spot, uh, scout out even further off the image, and then land uh, at that red spot on the far right. So by leapfrogging potential sites, we're always able to land at some place that's interesting. So Dragonfly mobility by the numbers. Uh, this is also wrong. It's a little bit heavier than that now uh, as the design progresses, as most spacecraft do. Um, so it's uh, going to be in the vicinity of about 800 to 900 kilograms actually now, but it's about three meters long. Um, it might fly for about 30 minutes uh, at, a, at a spot. Um, six kilometers net range means that the total leapfrog distance, if we flew in a straight line, is more like 15 to 20 kilometers, right? So we can cover a lot of ground in about 30 minutes. Um, a TESOL is a Titan day, is about 16 Earth days. Uh, so we're going to fly about once every other TESOL. So about one flight every Earth month. We'll cover a bunch of ground, we'll 
practically drain our battery, and then we'll stay on the ground for a while, recharge, take our science instruments, uh, and so forth. So the prime mission surface timeline is about three years, and we plan to cover uh, that approximate landing ellipse is about 100 kilometers wide. And the main reason that it's so wide is because of the uncertainty of Titan's winds on the day we land. We can't measure those winds in advance. So when we're spending two hours on our parachute and we're blowing one way or the other, uh, then, you know, who knows exactly where we're going to land. But if we land at the bottom right of that, we still need to be able to make it all the way to Selk Crater. So that's really the design driver behind the Dragonfly mobility system, is going all the way from the bottom right so that we can get to the center of Selk Crater there, and that's about 180 kilometers. Uh, so now I'm going to go into the software parts uh, of Dragonfly, so um, I'll try to cover uh, a few things there. So some of the unique aspects of flight software relative to other spacecraft. Um, we've got atmospheric flight. Most spacecraft don't do that. Most spacecraft at most have a re-entry system, uh, but most don't even have that. So for atmospheric flight, um, we've got to have fast closed loop guidance, navigation, and control. We're not just flying by a planet or something like that. We have to manage wind gusts and things like that. Um, navigation is fun. Uh, we don't have any GPS, so we're using terrain relative navigation. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we're also going to be using a multi-mission isotope, uh, radioisotope thermal generator. Same thing as Mars Curiosity and Mars Perseverance. Uh, so in order to charge our battery, our flight computers have to completely power down and then boot back up again later, maybe a day later, maybe two days later, so we can let our, our battery recharge. Uh, from a flight software perspective, that's weird. Most spacecraft do not power themselves down and, and stop their software from running. Um, so that uh, causes uh, some interesting things for us. Um, we're also, as noted, very far from Earth. So we've got to manage our uplink and downlink very precisely. So we're spending a lot of time in flight software uh, studying how to compress our data, uh, not only our science data, but our engineering data to make sure we can optimize the use of our downlink. Uh, I'm going to skip over most of this, actually. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I'll talk about this, actually. So from a flight navigation perspective, this part's interesting. So if we're going to fly for 15 kilometers, you know, total, uh, for 30 or 40 minutes, we can't navigate totally inertially. Right? If we want to target a landing site that's within just a few meters, 15 kilometers away, 30 minutes of flying, and we just wanted to use an inertial measurement unit, uh, it wouldn't be precise enough. It would drift too much in that time. So we have to have some sort of external reference. But there's no other external reference. There's no GPS right, or Galileo or whatever else. Um, so we've got to do what's called terrain relative navigation, but not just terrain relative navigation, but navigation relative to images from prior flights. So what we can do is use navigation cameras to take an image and then a second later take another image. And then we can compare the overlap between those two images and tell how far we've flown. So that can reduce our errors as we go from one point to another. And we take another image and another image and another image. But I talked about that leapfrog thing before too, which means as we're re-flying the leg that we had flown on our previous leapfrog, we have to have those images saved from a month ago so that we can uh, follow our trail from the previous flight and get back to where we had previously scouted. And so managing all of those images, the image uh, correlation algorithms that take you from flight to flight, uh, are, are all something that's being uh, worked on quite intensely right now. We also uh, have to detect hazards so we know where to land. Um, this is both for fault reasons and on our very first landing. Uh, the finest uh, imagery taken from the Cassini mission of our landing site has a resolution of 500 meters. So that's not great for telling us how many rocks, you know, are around there. Uh, and of course, again, we have a landing zone that's 100 kilometers wide. So when we land there, we have to be able to spot our own rocks, spot our own slopes, and find a safe place to land. So we're bringing some LIDARs uh, with us, two of them, uh, and those LIDARs will uh, scan a frame as, as we fly forward at a constant altitude and measure the deviations from a standard, uh, standard slope, standard flat slope. And so they'll be able to detect if there's a hill that we don't want to land on or small rocks. And then from those, you can see the image on the, on the far right, we can find the spots that are the farthest from any hazards. And then we can land in those spots. We can turn around, come back, and land uh, where we want to uh, from there. 
And that goes then to that systems uncertainty because the best Cassini data is so big, uh, we don't really know what the hazard distribution is. We hope there's not many rocks in the dunes. That's how it works on Earth. That's how it's mostly worked on Mars. Mars doesn't really have dunes, but it, it has something like it. Um, so we really need to know uh, about the best analogs and models possible. We need to design our system conservatively uh, to make sure that even if there are a bit more rocks than we expect, we can still land. Um, so that's something that we're still working through. Uh, we're only going to have less than 100 watts continuous power when we're at Titan from our uh, radioisotope thermal generator. Uh, and of course, we need a lot more than 100 watts even on Titan to actually go fly. Uh, so that's where we have to actually uh, power everything down and save everything, right? So anything that the ground has told us, you know, from weeks before uh, about what to do, we need to save all of that. And then when we boot back up, we need to load it all up again. So uh, that's for the flight software nerds. Uh, and then downlink and compression is something that we're working on a lot too. Uh, round trip light time is another thing that's, uh, that's fun. Uh, so because it's about three hours round trip between Titan and Earth, uh, we have to send our go for flight and then the whole sequence must be autonomous, right? So Dragonfly cannot be joystick and throttle, it can't have a controller on the ground, uh, and it can't have anybody actually responding to the faults on board. So everything, if something goes wrong, maybe we lose a rotor, there's a problem with the battery, uh, everything has to be um, uh, taken care of. The last mission to launch that's gonna go farther than Dragonfly was New Horizons, which my uh, organization, APL, also built. Uh, so we're trying to take uh, as many of the lessons learned that we can uh, from that mission for designing the software and operations for a very long round trip light time. And so that's Dragonfly. Uh, it's exploration and discovery on an ocean world. Uh, we expect to find a subsurface ocean there uh, to determine how far chemistry has progressed in environments that are providing the key ingredients for life. And that's my talk.